Hello and welcome to Weymouth Independent Evangelical Church. We're continuing with our online sermons as we're still unable to meet together in our usual meeting place. And we trust that God will bring blessing through the preaching of his word here online. Turn with me then to Philippians chapter 3 as we continue our series from this letter of Paul to these believers in this Roman colony. And our heading for today is Heavenly Citizens as we come to the end of chapter 3, where Paul has been refuting those who seem to have been claiming some sort of perfectionism, that they'd somehow already arrived at the height of spiritual progress, they'd attained the prize and there was nothing further for them to do. And Paul has been very clearly setting his own example that he is straining forward for the goal, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And he's determined to make every effort to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of him. And he goes on in that theme as we turn to verse 15 to 21. I'm going to read each verse as we go through and just make a few comments about each of those. So firstly, I want us to notice humility is needed. Verse 15. Where Paul writes, therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal this even to you. Paul is saying, I'm not there yet. And that's the way we should all be thinking. And if you have perfect knowledge, he's addressing those who are claiming to be mature, to be perfect is the word that he uses, then perfect knowledge recognises that there is more to be done. We're not there yet. That's the sign of maturity is humility, that we need to press on. Yes, we have security. We have been laid hold of by Christ. And that makes us eternally secure in him. But that in no way means that we sit back and just watch the world go by. No, there is a perseverance to us laying hold of the fullness of all that Christ has died to accomplish for us. And we'll go on later on in chapter three to see what Paul is reminding them of what we're aiming for, the glorious conformance to the likeness of Christ. And, and we're not there yet. Any honest, humble assessment of our situation makes that very plain. So to be in the light, to be accomplishing greater spiritual progress is to have the truth revealed. And if you just can't see, if you are convinced, Paul is saying to those who are claiming to be perfect and mature, if you just can't see it, then pray that God would reveal that to you. And if you're truly spiritually minded, then you will want to know the truth of God, have God reveal that to you. So don't deceive yourself that you've already arrived. Don't deceive others in some pretense of perfection. A true Christ-likeness is marked by meekness, a humility to recognise uh, that there is more to be done. God is still at work in us. Humility is needed. But secondly, from verse 16, we're focused on the destination together. Verse 16, nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. I've been involved in a number of walks up a mountain in a large group, both as a participant in a youth camp and as a leader of such things. And perhaps as you stand at the bottom and, and you're looking up to see where it is you're headed, you can't see the, the summit of the mountain because of the clouds and mist. And as you set off, it soon becomes apparent that there's a group who are really keen. They, they, they want to get up to the top as fast as possible, They're young and fit. And then there's those who are perhaps not so and quite happy just to, to wander slowly, perhaps a bit reluctant to get going at all. And the danger is that as the group spreads out across the mountain, that people get lost and uh, there's a frustration that sets in. And imagine if that was a military conquest, perhaps, where a group of soldiers were trying to get to a fortress on the hill. They would be easily defeated if they arrived in dribs and drabs, according to how fast people had walked up the mountain. 
And Paul is using a military term here in verse 16, where he's talking about their walking, walking by the same rule. He's saying, really, literally, there is to be in line walking. And that's a clear picture of a military group, isn't it? They walk in line, in step, together, because they want to be disciplined in getting from one place to another in an orderly fashion. And so as Paul is thinking about this quest, this straying forward, he's recognising it's a group activity. We have to think about those around us in this race, in this heading towards the prize. We have to encourage one another with progress. We, we have already attained to some extent, to some degree, Paul says. Let's be encouraged by that. Uh, when people are saying, I, I can't make it any further. I've gone as far as I can. No, look how far you've come. And it's not much further. The truth has not failed us yet in our Christian walk. Let's keep on walking together. Let's help you out. It's a together activity. And how much we'll need that? Because the route to glory is hard. Jesus promised that to his followers. It's a steep and narrow path. And its completion is uncertain in terms of timing. We just don't know how much further we've got to go. The, the summit remains in the clouds. How much we need each other. How unhelpful it is when there are those who think, well, we're, we're pretty much there and are judgmental because they think they're so much better than those who are dragging back. And those who are at the back think, well, it would be so much safer uh, to be where we could see where we're going. And perhaps that's a, a thought that comes from some of the false teaching that was uh, in mind earlier on in the chapter where Paul was warning about the dogs. People were saying, you must be circumcised. They were dragging people back to visible certainties, things that perhaps they felt safe about, but there were a denial of the gospel. And so easily, as these different factions become apparent, there would be a splintering, an individualism. And that's a denial of the gospel, isn't it? The gospel brings people together. Yes, it's an individual uh, exchange. Our old sinful nature is put away. In Christ, we receive that new righteous standing uh, before God. And that must happen individually. But he brings us together into the unity of the saints in Christ Jesus. And we're to express that. And when believers, churches, start splintering off into these different levels in their own mind or in the way that they speak or behave. That's a denial of the gospel. The cross is what unites us. We've all come into this race in the same way. And we all have that same destination, that same hope of the resurrection. We're all fueled by the same resurrection power. So let's get together to move forward. The glory is certain because Christ's power will accomplish it. So let's encourage one another and joyfully stick together as we press on. Let's be focused on the destination together. It would be helpful, wouldn't it, if our conversations are filled with thoughts of glory, of Christ, of the resurrection that will one day be ours in him. But then we go to verse 17 and see Paul telling him to follow good examples. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. That's humble from Paul, isn't it? It's not just uh, you must follow me, but people who follow my example and who follow Christ. That's all Paul is commending, isn't it? He's followed Christ. He's had the mind of Christ to serve others. He's focused on heaven in his desires. And... That's the best way to be a good example, isn't it? To serve like Christ and to be focused on being with God in glory. I wonder, do you have somebody who is a good example that you follow as they follow Christ? Perhaps in your past, but hopefully in the present too. Do you have good spiritual examples, good mentors who encourage you? And in turn, are you being a good example to somebody else? Are you being a good mentor, reflecting something of the likeness of Christ to other believers, encouraging them on, challenging them where there is room for improvement, where they have fallen aside in the race, where they've sat down on the racetrack, as it were? 
imitate Christ, set a good example to others, follow the good example of others. And Paul is recognising that that would be a good way to stick together in Philippi. But fourthly, there's the flip side of that. Follow good examples, but fourthly, recognise bad examples as we turn to verse 18 and 19. For many walk, Paul writes, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Paul is filled with deep sorrow as he thinks of these people who are enemies of the cross of Christ. It would seem that they must have professed faith in Christ, professed to be followers of Christ, and yet knew nothing of the power of the cross to turn away from sin. They, they knew no fellowship of Christ's suffering that Paul has referred to back in verse 10. There's no death to themselves. They're just living for themselves. That's really what he's saying there, whose God is their belly. It wasn't just that they were addicted to eating too much food. The belly here is a, a way of, of desiring our, our innermost desires, what, what we want for ourselves. And they've become enslaved to serving their own desires as if that were God. That takes primary place in their thinking and in their acting. They serve themselves and not only do they do they don't do it in secret they they glory in it they're boasting in their freedom to please themselves to indulge in whatever pleases them day by day had they misunderstood the grace of god in christ jesus that brings freedom but thought that that was freedom to do whatever they liked rather than freedom to be the person that god called them to be that's quite a common misunderstanding that Paul had to deal with, accusations that his gospel of grace that he preached, Christ's gospel of grace that he was commissioned to preach, I should say, uh, was somehow an excuse for people to do whatever they liked. And Paul refuted that time and again. Maybe these people who were serving themselves thought that, well, I'm right with God and I've got the resurrection of Christ guaranteed, what I do in the body now is irrelevant. That was a common thought from Greek philosophy that had infected some thinking within the church. The body was irrelevant, so do as you please. Maybe that's what was going on. And Paul cuts through all of the false thinking with that stark warning that their end is destruction. They are bound up with corrupted earthly thinking. He has great sorrow for them, great sorrow that others should be deceived by their false thinking and behaving, great sorrow because of the effect on the cause of Christ. Paul himself knew what it was to battle with sin. He had a hatred of his sinful tendencies, his, his belly, that kept him from doing what he really knew to be right, what he really wanted to do. Listen as we read from Romans chapter 7 and verses 22 to 25, as Paul gives that description of his battle. Uh, here's the summary of where he gets to, verse 22 of Romans 7. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He's been describing how the, the things he wants to do just can't seem to do because sin seems to take over so often and he's so frustrated. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God and with the flesh the law of sin. Do you have that same struggle with your sinful tendencies? That old nature, the flesh, do you allow that to dominate? Do you serve yourself? 
do you realize that when we do that we are making ourselves an enemy of the cross we'll each have particular tendencies uh, perhaps think about that now in what ways could you be described as serving your belly as your god just putting yourself first indulging yourself persistently and almost not realizing you're doing it it's become such a habit such a, a compulsion just to to please yourself and not think about other people walk in the way of christ who served others the fruit of our lives the, the way that we walk reveals what's really in our heart as we observe in our own lives things which are dishonoring to christ do we weep and do we weep when we see that in the lives of others where we see the good seed of god's word uh, that seem to be making so much progress choked by the distractions and desires of this world uh, to use the illustration that Jesus used in the parable of the soils. Let's be those who are dependent on the cross day by day, who are living our lives centred on the cross. That means our old self is put to death in Christ. And it's ours to take up that same cross and to continue to die to self as we follow in him. Like Paul, continually counting everything but loss for the sake of Christ. Anything that distracts from the gain that it is in him. We do the calculations as Paul has been doing in chapter 3. We count it up and we realise that all those things that we thought would give pleasure, thought would give merit before God, are actually as loss. What we need is Christ and his life transforming death and resurrection to con help us continue on this path to glory. And it's that thought of glory that Paul finishes the chapter with in verses 20 and 21 as we see transformation anticipated. For our citizenship is in heaven, Paul writes, from which we also eagerly wait for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So the enemies were enslaved to their bodily desires. They were showing that they were citizens of a condemned earth, blinded to the futility of living for the here and now, which is going to pass away. Everything is fading and spoiling, evidence that the world is coming to an end and it will not last, but not willing to change their mind about that, ignoring the evidence and investing all in that which will not last, rather than those who had been transformed by the grace of Christ, already knowing that they are citizens of heaven. That's what he says in it. We are, uh, we, uh, our citizenship is in heaven we are already citizens of heaven though we are absent from heaven physically and that would have been a concept that the philippians would have been able to grasp they were roman citizens far away from rome 800 miles i think it is they were under the rule of a distant ruler and all the privileges that came with being roman citizens in this greek colony all the expectations of the security that they had and the behavior that was expected of them as Roman citizens. And that idea can be lifted across to, to them as Christians. A faraway king has great benefits for them, great expectations of them, and they're to live in the light of who they are. The transformation has begun and they came to faith in Christ and they are to expect it to continue by the power of Christ who will complete his work because he is the invincible king, the king of glory, uh, who will share his glory fully when his work in us is complete. Our king is determined that sin shall not have dominion over us. Christ expects that and he will accomplish the complete defeat of sin. So why would believers who claim to be followers of this invincible king, be so foolish as to think differently, to uh, turn around in the opposite direction, as it were, to behave 
on the basis of lies, false thinking. That's where our behavior comes from, isn't it? What we do is a result of what we think. And if what we think is on the basis of what is false, then we're going to be doing things that are basically stupid. And Paul recognizes that our bodies are lowly now, but we can still glorify Christ in them. And not to use our bodies for selfish promotion, self-indulgence. We're to use our bodies recognizing what they will become. 1 Corinthians 15 gives that clear teaching of that. It, our, our earthly bodies are so different from the glorious bodies, but there is that continuation. So not to misuse our bodies for ourselves. We're destined to be conformed to Christ's glorious resurrection human body that is at the centre of the everlasting kingdom. The destination point of the history of this world is the Lord Jesus Christ, God, come in the flesh, died, resurrected, ascended into heaven, reigning over all things as the anointed king of all. He is the centre of all things for all eternity. And he delights to share that glory with us. We are destined to be conformed to it. What a day that will be to be with him and to be made like him. For all the pain and suffering of this world, for all the sorrow and sin, for all the death and separation to be fully and finally put away, subdued, never to trouble humans again. That is guaranteed because of the power that is at work. He's able to subdue all things to himself, Paul writes. Do you value that prize? When you look forward to something, you're, you're looking at it and, and aiming for it. How foolish to have something so precious and to turn your back on it. Be like visitors to the Tower of London to go and see the magnificent crown jewels just facing the opposite direction. What's the point of that? Do we not value the prize that is set before us? Do we not, in, are we not in awe of the privilege of being conformed to the likeness of Christ? Maybe sometimes the thought of the glory of Christ is too much for us. His glory is so unimaginably awesome we, we can't grasp it and is that why we struggle to grasp that we should share something so awesome when our horizon is filled with our own frailties and failures our own limitations maybe we've tried to follow good examples in the past and we just keep falling flat on our faces and we need to be reminded from the scriptures and from one another, of the hope that is set before us, the hope that is beyond sight. Our, our, our gaze is filled with the failures and fadings of this world, uh, but by faith we can raise our sights to that which is not yet seen, but gives us a firm hope. As Paul goes on to write in Romans chapter 8, verses 24 and 25, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope? For what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see we eagerly wait for it with perseverance can we show that spirit of perseverance as we spur one another on to lives that are filled with the hope of glorious resurrection fueled by the truth and by the power of the resurrection coursing through us together as we set encouraging examples to one another Encourage one another with our words and deeds as we hold on to what's already been attained, the progress that we have made. So easily we'd be discouraged that we just, uh, we are going in the opposite direction to glory. But we have so much before us, so much more that we could see God doing in us and among us. Let's fight against the discouragement that would lead us to lose hope. Well, may God help us to live out the gospel so that we may be a good example, that we may be an encouragement, and that we may live as those expectant of glory. There's three E's to finish with. Be an example, be an encouragement, and show that you are expectant.
of glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for examples in the scriptures of those who have been so caught up with the glory of Christ that they put away all that would distract and discourage. We pray that we would follow that example, not thinking complacently that we're at a, a finished level, that, that we have been transformed. Lord, the evidence around us is surely so plain that there is more work to do, that once that work in us, that work of grace is complete, you will draw us to yourself. May we be filled with the sense of the glory of Christ and his calling to us to come up to him, to be conformed to his likeness one day. May that fill our gaze, fuel our hope, and be a great witness to those around of the worthiness of our Lord Jesus Christ to be served in every part. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening and do join us again soon. Thank you.